speech for you. Um, actually, uh, it's always good to be uh, in presence in a conference like this. The last World con con uh, Congress that we had, we held it online three years ago. What it was supposed to be held in Marrakesh during the time I was the president of the Regional Science Association International, but unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we went full 100% online. And of course, this is the, our first uh, World Congress since then, and it's always good to be here to have this face-to-face uh, -face interaction. And you re already realized how beneficial it is for us to exchange ideas and build, build our international networks. Well, I thank the organizers for having me here, giving this uh, lecture. The topic is modeling spatial and economic impacts of disasters. Uh, what I plan to share with you, it's um, basically, uh, I built this uh, talk around a uh, recent paper we published in uh, Nature. Uh, but what I'm going to do is basically overview different applications from our research group at the University of Sao Paulo that led to this uh, modeling exercise on earthquakes in Chile that uh, related to the paper I mentioned. So the focus will be on a lot of uh, model integration uh, exercises. Uh, that's basically um, my main research area, doing large-scale modeling, integrating with different types of models. And uh, of course, we're going to focus not only on multi-sectoral approach, but also multi-regional as our core models within these uh, 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 integrated modeling systems. Well, the idea is to bring for you some food for thought based on highlights of different uh, works that we've done in the last uh, 10 years or a little bit longer than that, but that brought us to uh, come to these uh, uh, publications. That's a, a paper that uh, was published in 2022 uh, together with colleagues from the University uh, 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 in Mexico, the UNAN. Uh, they are seismic engineers, and we got together two teams, one team of economists, which I led, and one team of seismic engineers to get this integrated approach. And the key, the key word here is propagation. And you see that from all our applications that I'm going to share with you, we are always thinking about how a shock in a regional economy, in a local economy, propagates systemically across the whole uh, uh, economic system. Well, to, uh, we need data to do that, and the basic, the core data that we need is based on input-output systems. Actually, uh, it's, a, it's a good starting point since it provides us a, a, a picture of an economy, a detailed picture in terms of the uh, sectoral interdependence, but also, as you see in some of the applications I'm going to, to discuss here, it's also uh, the, the, the input-output output, output systems also provide a statistical basis for the creation of more elaborate models, more sophisticated models, and the, the kind of, the, the type of model that we are going to be using here, it's what we call the uh, spatial, spatial computable general equilibrium models. Well, instead of looking at national input output systems, what we do is to uh, explode the database, take into account the location of each activity and how they interact in the space, so we have very detailed database. How do you do that? We have a large experience in our research lab in uh, estimating this, this type of uh, interregional frameworks. So we did that for not only for Brazil, for different regions of Brazil, but also for different countries. And you see a list uh, uh, on this slide. Countries, large countries, small countries, countries with very, very uh, developed statistical systems, countries where the statistical uh, 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 agencies basically collapsed as we had the, the, the opportunity to work with countries such as Lebanon and Iraq to do this kind of modeling exercise. 
But based on that, so the, 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 the system is going to provide the uh, an important uh, piece of information for our simulation models. To have a simulation model, we need three types of structures. We need to define the analytical structure of the model. So based on theory, we have to define the variables and how and what, uh, which variable relates to, to with each other uh, variable. We have to define the functional structure of the model, how they relate in terms of the mat mathematical functional forms. And very important for our uh, discussion here, uh, the numerical structure, right? And the numerical structure is also a source of uh, uncertainty to our results, not only because we have to rely on behavioral parameters that the basic procedures to estimate them econometrically, but also on the structural coefficients that comes from the, um, the database that I mentioned related to the interregional input-output systems. So we get this, this three structure together. We have the, our uh, uh, data generating process of the economy, so to say, so we tell exactly how the economy works, so we are ready to run simulations. And, the, and, uh, and we, the, 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 the way to build this, uh, 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 this the, 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 the model that I mentioned is related to CG model. If you want to look at this uh, nice paper that uh, 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 analyzed different applications of CG models for impact assessment, not only of natural disasters, but of also of man-made disasters, that's a good starting point if you want to uh, look at this literature. Well, most of the, our insights come from integrated assessment modeling, uh, the experience we have for the last, well, we started doing that in 2007 for looking at the climate change impacts in Brazil. And the idea is to, we had to uh, work with different uh, experts in different disciplines. So we had all these uh, modeling chain starting with climate uh, climatologists we had people uh, experts in natural resources in land use in energy and demography and in the beginning the great a great part of our work was to try to get, get some cognitive alignment in, in terms of how these disciplines work and the regional science a lot of that about that because we have to to learn from different disciplines uh, what is their uh, 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 specific languages, specific time frames, spatial units, so that if you want to do model integration, we have to get this uh, uh, cog cognitive alignment. So we had this experience in Brazil, and you see that much of this integration comes from physical models to economic models. Our economic models are at the end of the production of, of this uh, modeling chain, so that we receive different inputs from these uh, uh, expert models in physical terms, and we translate that into uh, economic variables. And just for you to have an example, right? I will start showing you an example with uh, uh, a simple integration of a physical to a, an economic model. But the questions that the, the, the quick question for this presentation: is Why why do you do we have to do all this? Why do we need to quantify economic losses from disasters? Right? And there is a list of uh, reasons why, and I, I name them here. So we have to go to community vulnerability, evaluate the worthiness of mitigation. We have to determine the appropriate level of disaster assistance right, for the impacted region, for the impacted population. We have also to think about recovery after the disaster. So our modeling exercise, as you see, are going to improve the recovery decisions or help to improve the recovery decisions. And finally, we go at the end at the private markets so that we can inform insurers of their potential liability. So the first example I have here, three, three, 10 quick uh, applications for you, it's uh, that we have to think about this um, information coming from the uh, uh, physical models to the economic models in terms of an integration, and usually it's sectoral and regional specific shocks that we think about. So that's a, 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 a standard application that we where we looked at climate change in Lebanon. And basically, 
to, to get the systemic impacts of climate change in the country from the agriculture sectors and to answer questions, so what would be the economic cost of climate change, which regions would be more or less affected, we had to follow uh, this uh, integration pattern, going from physical models so that we would have the uh, climate change impacts, impacts, for instance, in crop yields, and translate that into productivity change to get the overall impacts. The kind of impact that we get across time in different, for different uh, uh, users, for different re uh, 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 regions, and that's, that help us to understand potential uh, uh, impacts. And what we learned from that is that linkages matter, right? Uh, and that's basically the nature of the input-output data that we use to calibrate these uh, general equilibrium models. And I have here just a few examples that helps us to take, uh, 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 to understand issues related to accountability on the pressure of not only natural resource, but also economic resource. Actually, you can map the uh, impacts on different issues. The three papers here are related, for instance, on uh, uh, doing, uh, 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 looking at the water pressures in Mor the Moroccan economy so that we can map the trading water in Morocco. So what's the pressure on, net, on water resource coming directly and indirectly coming from one region and not only domestic regions but also uh, 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 coming from uh, foreign countries. So we map that, that helps us for our modeling exercise to understand uh, uh, the drivers of, in this case, water demand in Morocco, but also we can use, for instance, a work we did uh, uh, recently for the Amazon looking at uh, deforestation and CO2 emissions. And we see, for instance, that uh, in this paper that's coming up in, uh, very soon in the uh, Nature Sustainability, tells us a different story from what's um, so far common sense uh, uh, in the international literature, is that most of the deforestation comes from foreign demand. And actually, that's what we show is that the domestic demand is much more uh, important to put pressure on uh, 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 natural resources from the Amazon region, despite the fact that it does not generate much economic impact in the region. So this kind of looking at regions, we can look at war, right? This is a, a, a paper we put together using the same time of uh, methodology to look at uh, how a region is integrated within a country. That's for a discussion about the Ukraine war. That's a what if, oops, what if uh, 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 one of the regions, in this case, in this exercise is Donetsk, would be, I don't know, annexed for Russia. What would be the loss, the direct and indirect loss related to the forward and backward linkages of that region. It's not only look at the, the share of the region in the, in the uh, uh, national GDP, but you have to take into account how the region interacts with national GDP, but you have to take into account how the region interacts with other regions of the country. So linkages matter. This is another, then, uh, the, another, another message that we got out of this uh, 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 body of research that we, be, we are involved on. When you go from, I mentioned about physical, link, physical variables uh, integrated to economic variables, and that's, what, that's a good example on how we have to rely on expert models to, in these integrated frameworks to improve the simulation design. This is related to a PhD dissertation defended in 2022, two years ago. Uh, at the Department of Economics at the University of Sao Paulo. And basically, what Ademir Rocha was looking at is he was trying to uh, integrate uh, um, uh, hydroclimatic models with spatial CG models with a proper uh, spatial aggregation related to Brazilian watersheds. So basically, given uh, 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 climate shocks that would affect water availability in the different uh, uh, watersheds, well, watersheds in Brazil, and that would create different impacts in different sectors direct that would propagate to the whole economy. And this type of models also help us to understand how can we think about endogenous adaptation 
to climate shocks as a, a, a economic agents would uh, change their uh, uh, behavior to adjust to the shock. So we could, in this, in, in this uh, example, we could uh, think about and through uh, uh, price channels and also through uh, the relation between uh, cap uh, capital and labor substitution, right? More ir irrigation, less irrigation in areas that are more or less uh, affected by water availability, right? And of course, when you look at the impacts on the economy, they would be heterogeneous by hydrographic region, but also when you look at the impacts on water demand and capital use through the adaptation mechanisms embedded in the model, we also see a different uh, 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 spatial uh, uh, picture related to those. Well, going uh, more local, uh, yesterday, uh, Sara, in her uh, uh, keynote address, she asked the audience about different uh, 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 issues that climate change would impact your uh, local area. That's one in my hometown, in Sao Paulo, right? Uh, this is a study we did for uh, thinking about the uh, uh, a way of better allocation, allocating uh, resources to uh, mitigate the effects of uh, floods in Sao Paulo. So every summer, now we are at the end of the summer in Brazil, now starting uh, our uh, autumn. Every summer, this is the picture we find when you have uh, this uh, heavy rain in Sao Paulo, right? And what climate change model, what climate models tells us about climate change is that it's going to increase the frequency and the intensity of such extreme events in the city. So that's going to be more and more frequent, frequent in our area. So what we ask, the question that we ask, okay, let's look at what are the economic costs of floods in Sao Paulo so that the city can have a, a more rational allocation of the budget resource for adaptation and mitigation given the strategic points related to, uh, to that. So we actually we collected data at, at, uh, for a given year for every single point. The, 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 the red dots here are basically the flood points. This is an stylized map. And the blue points are the firms. We have the location of each firm in the city, and we have some firm characteristics that we are going to use to help us doing the calculations. But once we have that, so that's the, the real points, you see, uh, the green points are, the, dot, the green points are related to, to flood, to, to firms uh, potentially affected by a flood point. We uh, say, for instance, that one single point may affect directly um, 137 firms in a ray of 100 meters around that. So we collect these this flood points, this data, Right? With some assumptions on the production function related to, to those, those firms, we are able to, to, to estimate the direct damage based on these, the characteristics of each firm. And with that, we feed, uh, we feed our uh, uh, CG model so that we, we ask uh, the following question. What if floods had not occurred in that year? and what would have been the difference in terms of regional output. So we could attribute to each single flood point a value of the uh, flood point, and not only locally, but also its repercussion outside the city, city limits, because that's something that is important to take into account in this modeling uh, exercise, because the city of Sao Paulo, the metropolitan region, they are, uh, it's a, uh, they, uh, the, the metropolitan region, for instance, accounts for 20% of the uh, national GDP, and it's very integrated through trade and income flows with other areas of the country. So whatever happens, happens inside the city, inside the metropolitan e area, it propagates to other parts of the country. So we get that, and then to reach the planners, we are able to assign for each point, flood point, what would be the potential uh, uh, GDP losses for the city, and actually what the city government did was to use this information to allocate uh, uh, the budget uh, for uh, construction budget for adaptation issues for flooding uh, uh, in, in the city by looking, okay, there's, there is a, 
uh, higher potential loss, economic loss here, so let's allocate more money in this area rather than an area that does not generate much loss. Right. Take into account network effects also, it's important. This is a, an animated map related to commuting flows within the broader Sao Paulo metropolitan uh, uh, region. And what you see here are people commuting from the uh, suburbs towards the downtown. If you take these uh, two rivers here, we sign in this where they meet, it's basically the, 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 the core of the CBD of Sao Paulo. And you see people moving around all the day, and what we did, okay, let's think about uh, uh, commuting uh, infrastructure. Uh, Sao Paulo has a multimodal uh, commuting uh, uh, transportation infrastructure, so people commuting using cars, using trains, using bicycles, but also many people using the, the, the subway network. And I say, okay, let's see what would happen, what's the, 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 if Sao Paulo subway system did not exist exist. Maybe some uh, terrorist attack in Sao Paulo, sh shutting down the uh, uh, infrastructure, the, the, the subway infrastructure. But we did the calculation, and actually, again, we had to work with our uh, uh, colleagues from different areas, and in this case, the, mod the system, the, the, the model integration was, we needed to rely on our transportation engineers that have this uh, travel demand model that would generate right, uh, the physical aspects of the infrastructure by also with and without the, the subway infrastructure generating uh, uh, um, a matrix of uh, generalized uh, uh, transportation costs between every single pair of origin destination that would feed a micro simulation model looking at the urban structure and at the end of the day that would generate uh, uh, change in productivity of workers living in one part of the city and working in another city. And that's actually very important because if we have to take into account all, not only these uh, commuting flows, but how they affect the uh, income generated in this uh, urban area. So we have to, this, to, 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 ISO, to, to define the place of production which may be different from the place of residence, which may be, be, may be different from the place of consumption. So whenever we give a productivity shock in a, in a, uh, in a, in a given sector located in a given municipality, because we know, we map that, that workers in that sector, in that municipality, comes, uh, live in different places, that's going to affect GDP in the city, but the income that's going to be appropriated by these workers is going to be spent uh, somewhere, and that's going to generate a different uh, uh, spatial uh, uh, outcome, right? So uh, we, can, we can then cal compute the direct and the total GDP impact that's going to affect not only the city of Sao Paulo, where the whole subway uh, infrastructure is located, but beyond the city, it's going to, to affect other uh, municipalities in the metropolitan regions and other uh, Brazilian regions outside the metropolitan area. So that's something that we also bring to this modeling exercise. But we can go even more granular in our exercise, looking at very detailed traffic data to help us to understand localized impacts of an unexpected event. And this work, uh, basically, uh, we we're looking at uh, how do temporary disruption events affect cities. We relied on a very rich database provided by Uber. Uber, when they, when they, they were launched what they call Uber, Uber platform in different cities of Brazil, of the world, they came to us to ask for um, ideas for using their rich database to create a new product. And what we did with what we, 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 we uh, proposed to them and they accepted it was to, uh, uh, to estimate within this, we got, if for you to have an idea, we had for three years, every single Uber trip, the time, the origin, the destination, the arrival time, so that we had actually the real uh, time uh, measure in terms of two points in the city, and we got millions of observations to build this uh, very simple uh, 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 congestion uh, 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 index. It's a tri travel time index, which, is, which, 
where we basically compared, we defined a free flow travel time, usually in the middle of the night where there is no cars in the, region, in, in the city, and we compared for every single moment of the day, in every single day, within this, uh, during the three years, the observed travel time so that we could get this information. That's, and this information was very useful for us to, uh, uh, to do some event studies related to some uh, unexpected events in the city, right? Actually, we had that's a usual uh, travel time index, and based on information on the time, we can think about time, uh, these are general, general uh, uh, estimates of, for instance, the total time spent on, on the trips, the time that would be spent under free flow, the time lost due to congestion, and different times, different moments of time. And what we did is basically do some event studies looking throughout the three years. We analyzed rainy days, heavy rainy days actually. Uh, there was a national truck driver strike between uh, uh, 10 days in 2018. There was actually the 2018 FIFA World Cup. When, when Brazil plays, nobody, everybody stays at home. It's a national holiday, so no, there's no traffic, there's no tra congestion, uh, school days. And very important for this exercise, the closing of a, a bridge that collapsed in a specific day and was closed for almost three months. And basically, it's a simple event study when we put dummies for these, uh, 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 these specific events and we get right, results showing, for instance, that uh, if you look at the rainy rain, when there is heavy rain, you, you have a, an impact of, of, uh, uh, on congestion. During the bridge collapse, the, the, the time, travel time increased. But when Brazil played the first one, actually congestion actually disappears from the city, right? So we use that and actually have to put some value on that. So we have to use value of time and actually there are some Sorry, it's in Portuguese, but these are table of general equilibrium generated value of time for different uh, 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 time frames, short run, very short run, uh, and long run. And you use these, our estimates for GDP and household welfare losses combined with the hours that were saved or that were uh, 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 lost to get estimates. So, this, for instance, you see here the, the red line, that was the, the effect on travel time during a day, the specific traffic related to the, uh, the collapse of the bridge, while the green row compared to the base, baseline, which is the gray line, is related when you had the truck driver, dri dri drivers strike that less, bus, less trucks circulate in the city, so sometimes of the day the, 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 the congestion uh, uh, improve. So we use this information combined with general equilibrium simulated hourly data to get a, a, a broader estimate of this uh, for this quick impact assessment. This is the kind, so the, the, the data that we generated, you see moving over the days, the, 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 the pattern changes a lot. On the left, if it's a working day, on the, the right is a holiday, and you see that depending on the day, Right? This information provides very rich information for you to think about a specific event in a specific part of the city and how it affects systemically. Right? So that's something also that helps us to, to uh, 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 generate this quick impact assessment. Coming back to the, uh, to the uh, physical... Uh, 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 and economic uh, integration, looking at agriculture, because in Brazil, droughts due to climate variability is a very important issue. And so there have this student that uh, did this job, and I said, oh, uh, and, I, and, he, and I keep telling my students, never forget about uncertainty, because there is a cascade of uncertainty, especially with, related to the numerical structure of the model, not only the economic model, but all models that are using an integrated uh, modeling framework they are prone to a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty related to data, to aggregation, to even to uh, uh, the, the analytical and functional uh, structures of the model. And that's a model that this student right, uh, did, basically trying to look at climate scenarios affecting productivity, similar to the, the one to met to, to the, to the uh, 
the one I, I, I showed you for Lebanon. But the idea is that, okay, there is this snowball uh, effect of uncertainty. And he says to me, oh, professor, you keep telling me about the uncertainty. I said, I'm not, I'm not sure whether I'll be able to, to defend on time, but okay, but you're going to defend unless you take it, uh, 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 this, this uh, 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 issue seriously, right? So that's he, he, what he prepared, showing that I was keeping uh, teasing him about this uh, very important issue related to this simulation exercise. And with uh, uh, a colleague from uh, Paraguay that's here, right? Uh, we took this uh, 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 one step further, doing a similar exercise with, uh, with for Paraguay related to to the uh, accumulated productivity chains in the agriculture sector due to climate change, but bringing uncertainty into the uh, picture, basically using the information from our econometric estimates of the effects of climate variables on crop yield, yields, right, and generating distributions of the shocks so that we could draw uh, uh, different scenarios one at a time for uh, regional shocks related to agriculture, and can, for in this case, for 10,000 simulations, we would get, uh, uh, we would be more confident about the results. So in this case, given a given a, given a, a scenario of climate change, it tells you that Paraguayan economy would tend to 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 lose in terms of GDP and uh, and um, and uh, a little bit uh, a, little, a small reduction in the regional inequality. So we can also be, we are also able to get these trade-offs, right? So you get this. So what did you, what did we do in this uh, NatureCom paper? Looking at the uh, risk caused by the propagation of earthquakes. We look actually, we are two teams, one in Brazil, another in Mexico, looking at earthquakes in Chile, right? And basically what we we came from the state of the art that our colleagues from uh, our seism, uh, seismic engineers would look at uh, an impact of climate uh, of an earthquake, right? So they would have all this standard methodology where they would look at three important components: the hazard, the earth, the, the, the exposure, and the vulnerability. In terms of uh, physical loss, they would put some some numbers on that. And what we did was to link that to a spatial CG model so that we could transform the usual uh, uh, estimates for uh, natural uh, disasters, in this case for earthquake, getting the propagation across the uh, economy. And we did that using this um, uh, interregional CG model for Chile. And what, what the, the way we did the exercise, we would simulate based on, on uh, geol geological aspects of the Chilean economy. One earthquake at a time, it could be very severe one, but it could be a lighter one. So we did that over 40,000 times to get a, a distribution of the, 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 uh, um, of the potential impacts. And actually, what we see, actually, we, the, the, our, our engineering economy, they have, the, they have a very detailed uh, 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 data on on the every single building in Chile. So in terms of the residential, non-residential, and sometimes they could put some information related to the big sectors that they use, and we would aggregate that to, to generate capital stocks change in specific regions, in specific uh, sector of Chile, doing that many times so that we could get this uh, propagation. So in summary, right, we depart from the probability distribution of direct losses belong to each sector and region. So we get the annual frequency with which that particular loss scenario takes place. So for a very strong, for a very severe earthquake, it may, the return period would be every 1,000 years, but for very light earthquakes, it can be five years, 10 years. So we have this distribution, right, that we integrate this information with the spatial CG model so that we also, at the end of the day, we get probabilistic scenarios uh, of indirect losses re uh, respect to several components of the economy. So this modeling framework brings, up, brings together many of the previous uh, insights that we got from other applications. But what's coming next is that after the publication of this uh, paper, it 
brought the attention of some of the uh, international multilateral organizations such as the UNDRR, the United Nations Office for uh, 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 Destruction Risk, risk, uh, risk Reduction, uh, Disaster Risk Reduction, and they hired us to do some experimental uh, uh, work for Eswatini and Costa Rica, in the case of Eswatini, applying this methodology for droughts in the region. Eswatini is the uh, former Swaziland, close to South Africa, and Costa Rica, which is also a region that's very prone to earthquakes. And the World Bank also uh, uh, commissioned a research to look at floods and sea level rise changes in, uh, in some of the uh, uh, coastal cities in the Mediterranean area of Egypt. And we did that. I'm going to show you how it works. Race basically, they have this... Uh, this uh, expert models based on also very rich uh, information about the city structure where they can uh, simulate for different climate scenarios, different uh, 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 exposure levels for the residential and non-residential infrastructure for every single city. And we then, using some uh, of our uh, expertise, we can actually look at how a specific scenario, that's, that's, the, uh, the, uh, for that's one, the first one is for uh, Port Said, the second one is for Damietad, but basic what I, I have to call your attention is that we can actually, through this modeling exercise, assess the level of exposure of residential and non-residential infrastructure, and using the approach that we developed, we can transform that into uh, economic costs and see if that for different climate scenarios and for different uh, time frames, we get different uh, impacts so that the city can decide whether it's worth or not to invest money to adapt and to mitigate some of these potential losses that may happen. And actually, we have for different uh, return periods, for more intense, that is going to that happens every 1,000 years. For those more frequent, that would happen more every five, year, five years. We would generate uh, uh, different costs, as you can see from this graph. And finally, uh, how can we use this modeling exercise to improve recovery scenarios? And that's a work that uh, is going to be more in-depth exploited tomorrow in a presentation by my student uh, Mahmoud Arbush in a, special, in a session related where, where he's going to detail this, this, this uh, work. But something that's related to the earthquake that happened, that hit Morocco last September. Right? And we were able right, together to give an uh, agile response to the government to see, OK, the government decided we have this destruction, we have to assess the damage, and we need to know not only the uh, economic cost, but we are going to put a package of 120 billion Moroccan dirhams in dollars. It's 12, 12 uh, 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 billion dollars uh, over five years, and we need to know how it's going to affect the regions. And the key question is how is the government going to finance? Where is this money coming from? Right? And what we did was to use our modeling exercise first to go from the direct damages to the propagation of the impacts in the whole uh, Moroccan economy at the province level. And there is a discussion also on how this money is going to enter the, uh, uh, the economy. It's just basically to rebuild the economy as it used to be before the earthquake, or you're going to think about upgrading, given the opportunity that the earthquake created for, that, for the affected region if you are going to use this uh, stimulus also to upgrade the region to make it better than previously it was. And actually, this, this is one of the, 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 the decisions that the Moroccan government had. This was to upgrade the, 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 um, the infrastructure of the affected areas. And basically, the question that remains is how is going to, what are the financing? financial sources for these resources. And what we did was to simulate three, uh, 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 three stylized scenarios. One that's going to be fully funded by increasing the debt of the country. So it's new money 
basically because the payments would be beyond the five years uh, expenditure. The other extreme scenario is that would be fully invested, this is number three, by relocating investments from other areas to the affected areas, and the intermediate scenario that would be half and half. And what we see when you simulate that is that depending on how these uh, uh, reconstruction uh, uh, resources are funded for the uh, affected area, and that's the high atlas because they're receiving uh, it's receiving all the money, it doesn't make much difference, but for the country as a whole, this is the trajectory of, of GDP, this last one here. When it's fully relocated, it can be a zero-sum game for the country as a whole in terms of growth, because you are relocating expenditures across the space. This is uh, Mahmoud's presentation, this is an invitation for you to come. And then I have a, a couple of slides less related to what we can learn from disaster and uh, 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 resource misallocation. Basically, the question, it's not really uh, much related to modeling, but basically uh, we see, we learn from all this exercise that the more vulnerable the areas, the exposed areas, of course, uh, higher tend to be uh, 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 the potential impact, ceteris paribus, right? But you see that these, uh, 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 these us communities, they know what's needed to reduce vulnerability to a natural disaster. You have a whole list of related to awareness, education, preparedness, and prediction, and warning system, and so on, and also some uh, 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 expenditures related to adaptation and mit mit uh, mitigation measures, such as the adoption of zones. So we have a list of things to do. So uh, actually, the, 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 what we learned is that potential impacts can be minimized by adequate, adequate policies, right? Um, the point is, that's my final point. We actually, yesterday night, I don't know if you are aware, we faced a regional science community disaster, right? We got together a bunch of regional scientists to play football, to play a, 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 a game with a, a team of the university here. And they were not fair because they put together a very professional team made of young, uh, young people that were trained, were training for the last three months every day to face us. And that was an actual disaster, right? <laughs> it's, it's the size, if you, if you are into football, it's, in my mind, when I arrived at home, it was the same feeling that I had when Brazil lost in the World Cup 7-1 to, to Germany. A catastrophe, right? And Andrea was here, he can, right? But what happened is that we also saw some opportunities related to that, right? Other than the spatial interaction, we walked home at the end of the, ga the game, chatting. People very, uh, very fast forgot about the game, and they started talking about potential interactions for writing papers together. By the time we arrived, at the hotel, I could hear at least three or four ideas for paper, papers collaboration. We are talking about people from seven different countries, right? And that's something that's also related to the uh, resource misallocation, right? These are all bright regional science that attempt to play football against a young team. That's not going to work. That's going to be a disaster, as it actually was. So again, uh, the key message is that even for uh, there is some opportunities that we can learn from post-disaster recovery uh, scenarios. And that's, this walking back to the hotel was something that I'll take back home and Paul probably uh, interact further with my colleagues from this team. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I wish you had it. <laughs> so uh, please remain on the stage. Okay.
And uh, first of all, just a brief note. I was one of the witnesses of this yeah, last night disaster, <laughs> and I, I'm happy to report that it was not that serious as Eduardo has described it. So actually, it was, it was quite a fun game, so to say. But nevertheless, I have to admit that my colleagues actually took it very seriously, <laughs> and I did not ask them to do that. <laughs> OK, so thank you very much. That was a really exciting presentation. And we also have a discussant. Uh, the lights are quite sharp, but um, Dr. Jorland uh, Ayala Garcia is here uh, with us from Colombia. <laughs> and he was also part of last night's uh, disaster assessment exercise. Um, so actually, the floor is yours. Uh, since you are also very experienced, as far as I know, in natural disasters, uh, this is a perfect uh, matching for being a discussant. So please give your, your detailed views on that. And then I actually pass the floor back to Eduardo to react and all for the audience. Thank you. I had already forgotten about what happened last night. I, I really don't appreciate you bringing it back now. Um, hi, um, thank you uh, everyone for being here. Thanks Eduardo for the presentation. As, as I was introduced, I'm going to give some comments, some reactions about the uh, presentation that Eduardo just gave. And um, the first one is, uh, it, it's really interesting how it is combined in your talk, like these different types of natural disasters. Some of them are like high probability, low cost, such as floods and like uh, droughts. But you, you also have this other way of, of understanding uh, disasters as those that are low probability, but they show the highest cost, such as the, the earthquakes. So in, in the world, uh, the beginning of the past century, most of the people who died because of natural disasters, they used to die because of droughts and floods. But in the last 30 years, uh, earthquakes are the ones that are creating the highest death tolls around, uh, in all countries. So it's, it's very important to understand like the difference between these two types of disasters because they have uh, different ways uh, of propagating and 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 they they pose different uh, challenges to local to governments to deal with those disasters. And uh, the second point is. Um, since I am a public finances guy, I worry about money, uh, the governments. And I really like your last, your last slice because it poses a, a challenge that all governments face. And the, first, and, and the challenge is the next one. Okay, I have to invest in preparedness, but I also need money. I need to keep money in case the disaster happens. But we don't have, uh, we, we still don't have a clear rule of decision, like how much money should we allocate to disaster risk management, and how much should we allocate to pre -invest, preemptive investment versus post-disaster investment. And given the regional complexities that when a, once a natural disaster is occurring in one place, the negative consequences are uh, spreading around the country. So how, how do we uh, uh, alleviate the negative consequences? Like, where do we invest the most? Of course, in the place where it happened but we should also take into account that the damage go beyond uh, the places where the disasters are occurring. So there are several questions that, uh, that I have, like what are your, what are your thoughts on, on, on these dilemmas that, look, that governments are facing? Like the first one is, okay, how much money should we allocate for every, like, um, for every year if we are going to talk about disaster management? Because once you decide to invest in preemptive investment, you, you, you invest in preparedness, that's less resources you will have for public infrastructure, productive infrastructure, such as roads, ports, airports, and this is going to affect your long, your, the, the growth in the long run. So this is not an easy question, it's not, it's not, a, it's not an easy trade-off the government face, especially if you take into account that research shows that, pol that the voters favor post-disaster uh, or relief spending. They don't, they don't like, they don't favor politicians who invest in preparedness. When, when the politicians invest more in preparedness, they are not uh, uh, as, they don't get too much political um, benefit from that as if they expect the disaster to happen and then go and uh, make um, alleviation expenses. So this is like a, a set of trade-offs that are really uh, not well aligned in incentives for uh, politicians to make the right decision. And um, 
yeah, that's uh, those are my those are my my comments. I worry about the the consequences that um, in the political side, uh, uh, voters are favoring post disaster investments, and they are rewarding politicians who react instead of uh, rewarding those politicians who um, anticipate. Thank you. Uh, those are my uh, comments and reactions. I hope. Um, thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. So I really appreciate your comments, and they actually touch a very critical point with the political economy of pre and post disasters. Has a, uh, disasters has a one thing that, despite the fact that you know we can ex uh, we can um, define the costs related to different time periods and different probabilities, you never know when it's going to happen, right? And so that if you if you put ourselves on the, the shoes of a policymaker, countries with different different levels of uh, uh, of wealth, countries like uh, Eswatini, where we are doing work for for the UNDR about drought, what the people there say, okay, uh, professor, that's very interesting, but we have to rely on international aid, right? We are not going to uh, put our uh, scarce budget resources to um, prepare for a drought or either to uh, uh, try to, to, to mitigate a drought. So whenever there is an issue, we go to the international organizations, to other countries to ask for uh, aid. So that's true for Eswatini, and that's true for Brazil also in a sense that it's not relying on, on, on international aid, but it's allocating over time in a sense that, as you mentioned, it uh, favors post-disasters because of all the political, uh, the political uh, I mean, effects that it has for the, okay, I came here. Whenever there is, in Brazil, there are many, many natural resources related main, mainly to landslides, floods, and droughts, when the, whenever there is a, a, dis, uh, a disaster, you see the, the day of the disaster, the politician on TV, if it's a good politician, telling the population that's going to help to recover the region and so on, despite the fact that the region was not prepared for the disaster. And that's basically how the game uh, works in terms of uh, budget allocation, especially in the developing world, and I, I'm sure also in the developed world there is also this issues that happen. But that's a critical issue related to the uh, uh, two points that you mentioned. The rules for allocation of resources, pre or post disasters. For pre, it's a, it can be just a, um, a gamble with, the, with nature in a sense in both cases, but also the political economy related to this one. So yeah, that's, I mean, of course, if you ask my, some of my colleagues that are in public finance, they will come with a optimal rule of how much money uh, they should allocate given these probabilities. Actually, the, this is done by the, using another meter from the insurer, insurance companies, right? But when you go to government, of course, they face this dilemma and they prefer to, to spend the money in other things. So, um, yeah, I think these are my comments on your comments. I thank you very much. I appreciate that these are critical issues for this debate. Thank you. Okay. So, so I should thank you for attending this <laughs> session. And I'll be around if you want to make specific questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Haddad. And uh, after the end of uh, this plenary session, some kind reminders for all the uh, visitors of the Congress. First of all, for those who have applied to visit the animation studio today afternoon, the bus is going to pick you up in the courtyard of the campus, just at this uh, long glass uh, uh, ceiling uh, to your right-hand side. There is a door 
which leads out, and uh, the bus is going to depart at quarter to three. So in, uh, sorry, it's quarter to four, so in 45 minutes. Uh, the other information for you that we will have a central focal point tonight uh, after seven o'clock in the city center. It's a pub called Beszélő uh, Köntös. So uh, you will get uh, the exact locations. You got the exact locations today morning in the letter. And we still have very few, just a couple of tickets for tonight's uh, National Folk Dance Ensemble uh, dance show in the Agora Cultural Center in the city center. So if anybody would like to apply and uh, would like to visit this uh, very stunning folk dance pro uh, production, then please apply at the email address which was also distributed in this mail today morning. And the last information for tonight in the city, there will be a bus uh, which will pick you up uh, at 11 o'clock in the city center. You also get a location, you got a location uh, in the email message from today morning. So uh, if you plan to visit the city center, then uh, you can just do that uh, in a relaxed way. And at 11 o'clock, the bus will pick those up who are coming back to this direction. So those living in Sheraton Hotel, Aqua Hotel, and in Granada Hotel will get a lift. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Once again, thank you very much for this uh, very fascinating uh, keynote. And uh, after a break, at 4 o'clock, we will continue with the panel session. Thank you. Thank you.